All right. Sorry for the delay. I was passing stuff out and getting the my setup up here going. Here, let me pass that out. So um, I am currently in the process of returning your homework for. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of like 34 out of 35. Like I, I didn't notice it when I was originally going through it, but usually that that means you know. Um, you know, if I if I have 18 people in the class and everybody's doing the same thing and I'm doing something differently, the law of probability tells me I might have something wrong on my solution as opposed to everybody else. I can make mistakes. Remember, I'm I'm allowed up seven, right? So um, I'm going to check the solution of problem number four because it looks like, I, but it looks like something's off. Although it also looks like there's something off on people's answers because. Uh, I'm getting different answers across the board. So I'll look at it and I'll get you a, a better answer as to what's going on on that problem uh, on Monday. Um, I, I'll check it out. I, I don't know what, what, because that was a pretty straightforward problem. I don't know what happened, but I'll look into it. I'm fair like that, usually, except when I put L over R on steel exams. Whatnot. I'm mentioning L over R today in steel, so please don't, you know, please reserve the uh, spoiled tomatoes, you know, don't, th you know, I'm talking about throwing tomatoes. When you boo. Okay. Don't forget homework number five, T-beams and doubly reinforced beams. Um, we're going to do our last doubly reinforced example today, and you'll, I mean, it's pretty rote. It's long, uh, it's longish, but it's not hard. Um, it's pretty straightforward. If you understood what we did last time, I think you'll pretty much understand what we're going to do with doubly reinforced beams today. There's just a little bit more math associated with it. And then that's probably not going to take all of 50 minutes, so we're going to get into talking about shear. Um, shear is different. How we handle shear is a little different. And it takes some discussion, so um, I'll take my time with that. And, uh, and yeah, so let's get right into it. So. Last time, if you recall, you know, we've been talking about the concept of a doubly reinforced beam. And essentially what we've been saying is they're a lot like T-beams in the sense of capacity. You know, we compute the capacity of the concrete steel couple plus the, concrete, uh, the capacity of the two steel steel couples and add them together. And we derived that expression last time because we had that the nominal moment capacity was the concrete force times d minus a over 2 plus the uh, force in the compression steel times d minus d prime. And the nice thing about doubly reinforced beams is that moment capacity expression actually doesn't change. Like that's the same. It's still the compressive force in the concrete d minus a over 2 and the compressive force in this upper layer of steel times d minus d prime. What can change, however, are the two forces, the compressive force in the concrete and the compressive force in the steel. And the variable is whether or not this upper layer of steel has yielded. Because of ACI requirements and because of just physics and, and how reinforced concrete behave, uh, behaves, uh, tensile steel always yields. Like there's never an issue with, with the lower layer of steel that's in tension hitting its yield strain. That always happens. And I think by now, that has ne we've never had a beam that we analyzed where the lower layer of steel did not hit FY. Like that, that's never happened. In fact, ACI wouldn't permit it anyways because there's a strain limit. Remember, the strain has to be greater than or equal to 0 0.004. So there's no way that that won't happen. But the layer of steel in compression, there is nothing to say that it has to yield. It might not. And if it doesn't yield, the math gets a little bit more intense because that compressive force is not the uh, area times FY. It's the area times whatever that stress is. And that stress is computed as E times the strain. And that strain is 0 0.003 times C minus D prime over C. And so when you write your equilibrium expression, the fact that all the forces in compression must equal all the forces in tension, you end up getting a quadratic expression. You get this. And this is only used when the compression steel does not yield. And so you'll get some practice today uh, exploring how that works. So last time we did this example. When we did this example, we found that the upper layer of steel did yield. So the forces were pretty easy to determine. It was pretty straightforward. What about this example? So first off, the example looks very, very similar. And, and it is very, very similar. A lot of the dimensions are the same. What is changing from example to, to example is the material strengths, because you'll notice FC prime went from 3 KSI to 4 KSI. And you'll notice that the steel reinforcement 
got uh, shifted a bit. You know, the last problem had four number 11s on the bottom. This one has four number 10s. And up top, we went from two number 9s to two number 7s. And that's just me changing the parameters up a bit so that you can see what happens when the steel doesn't yield. Now, spoiler alert, the steel up top does not yield. But I'm going to do the problem assuming that I don't know that, and I want to sort of demonstrate to you how that works. So with that, I'm going to shut up a bit and sort of set up my example. Man, that is, I don't get why it does that every time. Okay, so here is example 11b. Now, remember for this example, um, the FC prime ch uh, is still, or it, it changed, sorry, the FC prime changed, but the FY did not. Okay, so what I mean by that is the epsilon sub y is going to be the same as it was from the last problem. See, we said it was 60 KSI over 29,000 KSI. And so, does anybody remember that numerical value? 207. 207, okay. So... Okay, so that's going to be a rather important value to see whether or not this upper layer of steel has yielded. Now remember, when you're doing a problem, if I just show you that picture, unless you can do all this math in your head like that, you have no idea whether or not that upper layer of steel has yielded or not. So we're going to assume that it has. And so we're going to do this problem the exact same way that we did our previous problem. So we're going to assume... that compression steel yields. Okay, so that means that the compressive force in the, or, sorry, the compressive force in the concrete plus the compressive force in the upper layer of steel has to equal the tensile force listed below. Okay, or the tensile force from the steel below. And so the equation is exactly the same. This is 0.85 FC prime AB, this is AS prime times FY, and that equals ASFY. And so therefore, A, that's what we don't know, is AS minus AS prime FY, 0 0.85 FC prime B. And so, I, I hope I'm not going too fast, but this is exactly what we just did in the previous example. I mean, the formulas are exactly the same. I'm really just plugging and chugging. The only thing that's going to change a little bit is our inputs, because, for instance, our areas change. This is 5.09 square inches minus 1.20 square inches. This is 60 KSI, and then we have 0 0.85. This ended up being 4 KSI and this is 14 inches. So somebody help me out and tell me what that ends up being. Because even though it's cold, snowy day, you should always have your Casio FX115 ES Plus or equivalent calculator. Or your, your HP, for those you know of you that think reverse notation is the best thing ever. Man, it, if I had the YouTube comments turned on on this one, you really want to get engineers fired up. Start asking about, you know, Casio versus TI. Ooh, it gets intense. Say it again. 4.903 inches. This is A, right? And so C is A over beta 1. And we need C because we have to determine the strain in that upper layer of steel. And so that's 4.903 divided by what? There you go. It is 0.85 because our 
upper or our concrete uh, compressive strength is 4 KSI or less. If it's ever larger than 4 KSI, our beta 1 drops up until it hits 8 KSI. So. And so what, uh, what does this come out to be? 5.7, Let, let's, let's get a little, let's say 6.9. And, and because I want to make sure that I'm absolutely crystal clear on these strain calculations, remember strains are tiny, so I want to, I want to make sure I'm, I'm right. And then this is 0 0.003, and it's C minus D prime over C. Now, if you want, you could actually do the subtraction the opposite way. You could do D minus C over C as long as you use D prime. The only thing that will happen is the strain comes out negative, which if you're a, a, a mechanics purist, that might actually make more sense because it's a strain in compression. So maybe compression strain should be negative. I don't think it really matters just as long as you recognize this is compression. So. And what's D prime? No, 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 D prime. Say it again? 2.5. Just making sure everybody's paying attention on the dimensions that you don't use 24 inches. Okay, and you got, say it again, point 0.147. And so I'm boxing that in blue so that we can compare this and this easily. So remember, the value up top, that's the strain of steel at yielding. So the strain has to be at least this or larger for it to yield. But this is the strain that we're actually getting. So we assumed that it yielded, and then we computed the strain, and we found out that's not the case, right? So is our assumption that the steel yielded valid? No, it's not. So we have to do something differently. Okay. Uh oh. Seven zero. Uh oh. I didn't ask for a second, so that's like a point zero two mistake on me. So epsilon sub s prime is less than or equal to epsilon sub y assumption. is invalid. Okay. So, here's what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to, does everybody have this? Let me go back to the PowerPoint real quick because I want to make sure, like, this is one of those things where it's very tempting for you as a student to go, Okay, Dr. Mike, I don't care. Just tell me what, what the damn equation is so I can plug the values in. It's Friday, it's cold, it's snowy. Come on. Stop messing around. I think this is important, okay? So here's the, the presentation, right? And what we did is we computed the strain in the steel at yielding, and we compared it against epsilon sub y, and we found that it didn't yield. So what that means is this isn't right. This is our compressive force in the steel. It's AS times E times the strain, so this right here. So I want everybody to follow along. So I do C equals T, 0.85 FC prime AB plus this has got to equal ASFY. Now, how do I get from here to here? Well, I got a fraction on this term, so let's multiply everything by C. So ASFY times C, this times C, so see how I'm going to get a C squared, right? And then so I'm going to have this, and I'm going to have parentheses. Now let's distribute that multiplication out, and then let's do some factoring. Factor out everything that's got a uh, C squared, everything that's got a C, everything that's got a D, and we are left with this. It's a quadratic equation. Everybody okay with that? Okay. So I want everybody to be crystal clear as to, like, where this equation is coming from. I don't want you to think it's magic. It, it really isn't, okay? Now, I'm lazy. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to snip this. And here's the equation. 
And so here's what I'm going to do. Okay. Now, just so everybody is clear, what did we get for C up here? 5.769? Remember, that's wrong. Okay? That's not the C value because the assumption is invalid. So we have to figure out what C is. Now, here's how I'm going to do this. Everybody see this quadratic equation? This, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to calculate some constants. Okay? And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call them B2, B1, B0. Why am I calling them Bs? I don't know. My wife goes by Becky. It doesn't really matter. I could call them whatever. Okay? And so the B2, what I'm calling B2 is the stuff in front of the quadratic term, the stuff in front of the C squared. So we'll call it 0 0.85 FC prime beta 1 B. All the stuff in front of the C squared terms. I'm going to have to show my wife that. I don't know. She'll get a kick out of that. And so this is 4 KSI, this is 0 0.85, and this is 14 inches. So what does that come out to be? Now I'll go ahead and tell you one thing. As long as everything's in kips and inches, like KSI and inches and all that, the actual end units for this doesn't really matter, but we'll write them down just so you can see everything's consistent. And so what do you get for this? 40.46. Does everybody see that? Okay, and that's if you if you follow the units, it's kips per inch. So, but that doesn't really matter. Okay. Now B1 is everything that's in front of the C term. So that's AS prime ES 0 0.003 minus ASFY. So that's what is that? You're going to have to help me out with the areas. What are these? Okay, now ES, what's that? There we go. Exactly. 29,000 KSI. And then 0 0.003 minus, now I can see this one. This one's 5.09 square inches, and this is 60 KSI. And what do you get? And something might seem a little strange with your answer. It's not. Negative 201. Do I have a second on that? That's fine. We're setting up a quadratic equation. It's okay if this comes out negative. It's okay. And so if you follow the units, this is kips. Although, again, units don't really matter. Now, I want everybody to really pay attention to what I do here. Okay, so B sub naught is everything in this bracket. So it's AS prime ES... 0.003 d prime. But watch this. Look at the equation. Do you see how it's a polyjunk plus or times c squared plus a polyjunk times c, but it's minus. Does everybody see that minus? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say b naught is I'm going to put that negative there. I'm going to put that negative there. So this is negative. that times 29,000 two six negative 261 do I have a second on that anybody else get 261 okay so negative 261 inch kips. Is everybody okay with that? 
Here's why I put the negative there, and here's why I'm doing this. Watch this. I'm going to box this number, box this number, and box this number. So what I can do down here is say 40.46c squared minus 201c minus 261 equals zero. That's the equation that I have to solve. Now you all should have Casio FX 115 ES pluses or equivalents or your reverse notations or whatever. You should be able to solve that equation and so there are two roots to that equation. There's a C1 and a C2. Now, tell me what they are. So 6.037 inches, and then C2 is what? Do I have seconds on those values? With this being 6.9. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Now, one of these doesn't make any sense. Which one doesn't make any sense? The negative. So we'll cross that one out. And we'll say that C is now 6.037 inches. Okay. Now, you know how with T-beams and doubly reinforced beams we would say, oh, let's just compute all the compressive forces and compute all the tensile forces and make sure that C equals T. Y'all remember that? If there is any one time to check it, this is the time. Because it's very easy to make a mistake at this point. So checking your equilibrium is critical right now. Okay? So let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, C is 6.037 inches. How do I compute A? If I know what C is, how do I compute A? Beta 1 times C. Now, I'm not going to compute it, I just want it right here. I have two compressive forces, right? A compressive force in the concrete and a compressive force in the steel, upper layer of steel. Now how do I compute the compressive force in the concrete? What did we do last time? How, how do you do it in general? Well, we, well, I mean, that's we'll use it to compute a moment, but how do we compute the force? So it's 0 0.85 FC prime AB, but we don't have A. Instead of computing A, I'm just going to replace this with beta 1C. Is that valid? Okay. So this is 0 0.85 for KSI. 0 0.85. Remember, 6.037, new uh, C value, 14 inches. What does that come out to be? Now let's let's track some decimals on this. Let's go to like two decimal places. Two forty four point twenty six kips. Do I have a second on that? Okay, now. Watch this. How do we compute the compressive force in the upper layer of steel? It's not AS prime times FY. Why not? That was assuming it yielded. It didn't yield, right? So it's AS times whatever the stress is. What is the stress? Well, it's E times whatever the strain is, right? How do we determine the strain? Well, 
what is the strain? Like, how do we compute that? Yep. There you go. Boom. Right? So we have 1.2 square inches. We have E is 29,000 KSI. 0 0.003. 6.037 minus 2.5, 6.037. Now, I know some of you are going to compute this whole thing, but would somebody do me a favor and just compute that? Somebody compute just the strain in the steel and tell me what you get. I'm just curious. Is that what it comes out to be? So this is 0 0.00175. So it looks like we were right that that strain or that steel didn't yield because that's less than 0 0.00207. So we were correct. You know, once we correct our assumption. So, yeah, we were correct after we weren't correct. They were who we thought they were, and we let them off the field. So, um, anybody got an answer for this? So 61.17? Everybody okay with that? Now, let me ask you this. If you added up those two, what do you get? Say it, 305. 0.43 kips. All right. Now, what's the tensile force? ASFY. And so, what is AS? 5.09. What does that come out to be? Three o five point four. Everybody good on that? Everybody second? So why are they different? Like why are they slightly different? Rounding, basically. I mean, our C, we have written down C is 6.037, but it's not. It's 0 0.0372486, you know, carried on forever. So if we had tracked all of that, you know, in Excel or with our calculator or something like that, we would have gotten, you know, exactly 305.4. So because there's some rounding associated with these values, there's a little bit of an error. But I would argue if there's any one time to do this, it's now. Because we did a lot of work to get some random C value, checking to see whether or not it's right. This is really important. So um, with that, now that we have our C values, everything that I'm about to do from here on out is pretty rote. Okay? Because, let's see. So first off, we can compute our nominal moment capacity pretty easily because it's just force times moment arm plus force times moment arm. So to be clear, that equation is still valid. There's nothing about that equation that doesn't work. Okay? There's, it's, it's perfectly fine. The only difference is the actual C forces are different. They're not the same because the original assumption was invalid. So we can say, all right, this is 244.26 kips, 24 inches minus, and then what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say, we never computed A, but I've got 0 0.85 times 6.037. I didn't want to compute A because I didn't want to introduce more rounding errors here. I wanted to just leave it as is. Anybody have an answer for that?
6560.69 okay and that comes that's, that's foot kit or that's inch kip sorry that's inch kip so what is that in foot kips And then what's the, if we want to determine phi MN, what's the last thing we've got to compute? What may be the last thing we have to compute? Well, we've got MN, we need phi. What do we do to get phi? No, we're, we're in analysis mode, we're not in design mode. But when do, hold on, you're, let's, let's take a step back. When do you compute phi? Like, why do you ever have to compute phi? Okay, Let, let's, let's keep it simpler than that. When is phi 0.9? And when is it tension controlled? So what do we need to compute? There we go. The strain and the steel at the bottom. So... Like, Dr. Mike... It's Friday, it, it's snowy, and we got you for another hour on top of this. We're, we're like, we can only handle so much. We're about to yield. Your jokes are getting to be a bit much. When we write our, our course evals later, you're not going to like our comments about your jokes. So what do we got? Do I have a second on that? And so what does that value indicate? Well, <laughs> let's say it again, phi is 0.9. And so what is phi mn? No doubt. 491.3. What do you think? I mean, I, I know that's involved, but I mean, it's pretty rote. I mean, all you, I mean the, the hard part is determining C. But I'd really say, I don't know that that, other than some equations that are, are a little new, I don't really think, other than determining C, that there's anything that's incredibly difficult. So, but are there any questions? I mean, please, this is the time. You're not going to hurt my feelings. So. Everybody good? All right. I've got time to talk about shear, so I'm going to talk about shear relax. We're not going to do any crazy math anymore, but we are going to talk a little bit about shear. So first off, that's it for your homework five. That, that's it for, for, for that. So let's talk about shear. Okay, so first off, let's go back to basic undergrad CE312 structural analysis. If you have a beam that is simply supported and has a uniformly distributed load, its moment diagram looks something like that, right? You know? Now, we have d discussed moment until we're blue in the face. We've looked at singly reinforced beams. We've looked at doubly reinforced beams. We've looked at T-beams. We've analyzed beams. We've designed beams for moment. We have handled moment until we're blue in the face. But what we have not discussed is that. We have not discussed shear. Okay? Now, here's the thing, and, and I'll just go ahead and prepare you for this. Shear in here is going to take like a week and a half, you know, maybe a little bit longer. In steel design, shear is going to take us about 15 minutes. Okay? The reason why is in steel, 
Uh, and if you look at building elements like steel and or, or that's used for building systems, if you just look at the numbers, what ends up happening for rolled shapes like this one is you end up putting about 20 kips of shear on it, but it can hold up like 150 kips. Steel just has buku shear capacity in buildings. And so I'm not saying you can ignore it. I'm just saying you can cover it real quickly. But that's not the case with concrete. With concrete, we really have to, um, there's a little bit of finesse associated with um, reinforcing for shear. Now, the way that we reinforce for shear is we install stirrups uh, along the span. So this is a typical, I say it's typical shear uh, reinforcement layout for a beam, but really this is a typical reinforcement pattern for a beam in general. So you'll have some bars on the bottom, and this is your tensile reinforcement that's intended to uh, provide your, your bending uh, uh, strength. These sort of hoops that are going along the beam, that's where your shear uh, reinforcement uh, is coming from. And so usually you have some bars up top to tie it together, and that's basically your reinforcement pattern for the entire beam. Um, notice how your shear stirrups are, clay, are spaced really, really closely together near the supports, but out in the middle they get farther apart. Well, the reason why is because of the shears. Like, look at your shear. You have very little shear in the middle of the beam. So in the middle of the beam you don't need as many stirrups, whereas at the end of the beam you need quite a few. Okay. So that's going, I mean, typically that's how shear designs and how shear reinforcement patterns uh, uh, come about, is you're going to have more uh, uh, reinforcement near regions of high shear and less in regions of low shear. Now, let's talk about mechanics. So we've got to break out the old Engineering 216 mechanics of deformable bodies. I know everybody loves that stuff. And we're going to break out a concept called Moore's Circle. Now, here's the, now, I know it's been, a, I know, I know it's been a while. I am on for a week and a half. I did not, my professor, I didn't understand what he was saying. Okay. We've been going over it, and I didn't know for a week and a half. Do you, do you want me to explain more circle really easily? Yeah. Okay. Hold, hold on. Now, oh, okay, here you go. You're going to love this. You're going to love this. You got your karate chop? You got your Judy chop, and you got your ninja chop. Now don't go karate chopping while you're kung fu kicking. Go like that. There goes your leg. Not much use for a one-legged ninja. Never thought you'd hear that in an engineering class, did you? So, <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. That's the funny explanation. Here's the real explanation. Um, you have a member, right? You yank on it, right? Okay. And whether or not you understood more circle or not, and, and admittedly, more circle is kind of a weird topic to understand when you first hear it. But let's just go back to basics in structural analysis or what we've done up until now. You yank on it, and I've been saying for a long time the secret weapon of structural engineering is the samurai sword or a lightsaber. But what I've been doing is cutting like this. Okay? The question is what happens when you take a, a, a section cut and you cut it at an angle? Okay? So what ends up happening is if you cut something at an angle, you can split stuff up into sines and cosines. Okay? And what happens from there is when you're cutting sections at an angle, generally you're producing not only a normal stress but a shear stress on top of it. You've got a stress going this way and a stress going that way. Okay? Now, that, um, uh, you might go, well, uh, well, why the hell would you want to do that? Like, why would you want to make it more complicated? Well, the reason why is because what if you have a member and you're yanking it and you're twisting it and you're bending it? Like, what's the worst stress state? It's not as simple as just computing P over A and MY over I and, and, and whatnot. You have to actually look at the state of stress and figure out what's the worst case orientation. And, that, and you're going to see a very physical example of that here in a second. Now, that's generally what Moore's circle is for. Now, why is it a circle? Well, if you've had trig, you know that there's a very distinct relationship between like sines and cosines and the graph of a circle, right? There's a that's, that's it. That's more circle. That's, conceptually, that's it in a nutshell. 
What more circle will tell you is based on a given state of stress, it will tell you what is the worst way to cut your section to see the largest stress as possible. Why, as an analyst, we want to determine the, wor the largest stress as possible because that's what we want to design for, right? We want to determine the worst case scenario. That's more circle, okay? And that's all I expect you to understand. That's it. Now, let me give you a specific example with more circle, and that specific example is shear. Okay? If I take something and I shear it, okay, and that's it, just shear it, more circle will tell you that the worst case orientation for you know, uh, uh, analyzing your stresses is at a 45 degree orientation. And when you turn your section cut, when you karate chop it instead of Judy chopping it at 45 degrees, what happens is this shear stress turns into two normal stresses. And you have one normal stress that's yanking in tension, one normal stress that's pushing in compression. Pop quiz, concrete is a material that is very weak in what? Tension. When you look at a beam that is being subjected to very, very large shears and it fails, it cracks something like this, okay? The reason it cracks like this is because it cracks at a 45 degree angle and it's opening this way. It's opening in the direction that it's weak in tension, okay? So that's what, like when you look at a concrete beam that fails in shear, that's why it cracks like that. Because at 45 degrees, that's your worst case stresses, and specifically, your worst case stresses in tension, okay? There you go. Five minutes, how'd I do? More circle. Thank you. Now, one thing I will tell you about, and this, this is, I mean, I don't know that you'll ever experience this, but I want to give you a, a very significant thing about shear, okay? When beams that are designed according to the principles that we've discussed in class, you know, tension controlled and so on and so forth, if you see flexural cracks, and by flexural cracks, what I mean is this. I mean, you have a beam that looks like this. And if you start to see cracks sort of like that in the middle, you know, cracking along the region in tension, I mean, it's not great, but it's not the end of the world. I mean, there's only two types of concrete in this world, and that's wet and cracked. And concrete that's in tension in this region is probably going to have some hairline cracks here and there, and that's okay. If you are ever in a building or a, if you're looking at a bridge and you see cracks like this, in the shear, in the region of high shear at a 45 degree angle, you move your ass because when concrete beams fail in shear, they go quick, okay? So move, okay? Concrete in shear has a very brittle failure mode. It goes, okay? So it's just something to be aware of. Now, the way that we compute the capacity according to shear is pretty simple, okay? So the, the way that we compute the capacity, the design is, a, there's some finesse to it. But we use some of forces in the y direction. We got a load essentially pushing down on the section, so what's resisting it? Well, there's whatever capacity that can be generated by the concrete plus whatever capacity can be generated by the steel. And that's how we determine our capacity. It's the shear strength provided by the concrete plus the shear strength provided by the steel, and that's the capacity. Now, as for res uh, resistance factor, a phi value, before we had to compute a phi value, like we had to figure it out. Because of the failure mode associated with shear, it's not the same story. It's not like, well, if I change the way my beam looks, I can get a different strain. And so that's actually going to change the way it fails. That's not the case with shear. Shear, beams that fail in shear are going to fail the same way every time. So because of that, we can use a constant phi value. So in shear, phi is 0.75. And it's a little bit lower because of the associated danger with shear. When it goes, it goes quick. Now let's talk about each of these uh, numbers, okay? What about V sub C? V sub C, that's the shear capacity provided by the concrete. It is a plug and chug expression, okay? There are some terms, everything that's in this equation you have seen before. So lambda, you have seen lambda before, the lightweight aggregate factor. If you have lightweight concrete or sand lightweight concrete, it's less than one, the exact same values. Um, two times lambda times BW, the width of the web, if you have a rectangular beam, it's just the width times the depth times the square root of FC prime. Everybody tell me what's the deal with the square root of FC prime. 
You put in PSI and you get out PSI. So done correctly, when you compute V sub C, it comes out in pounds, like just plug and chug, because you'll get PSI here times inches times inches. So when you compute a V sub C, you'll get like 50,000 pounds. And so you'll need to convert that back to kips if your loads are in kips. That's V sub C. Now V sub S, and let me show you what's going on with V sub S. So V sub S is computed as follows. What we do is we take the area of the steel, the area of the steel times Fy times this term D over S, okay? Now, you know what D is, right? D is the effective depth of the beam, but what about S? S is the stirrup spacing. Why do we do D over S? Here's why we do D over S. We assume that the beam cracks kind of something like this. So D over S is basically like uh, an average of how many stirrups would occur over a crack. So we, occur, we assume that the cracked region is D tall and D wide because that would give us a 45 degree angle, right? And so D tall and D wide, we take that distance and divide it by S and that tells us, you know, if we take D over S and we get a value that's like 3.28, that's saying that we have about 3.28 stirrups within a crack. Does, does that make sense? So basically what we're doing is we're looking at this and we're saying about on average, how many stirrups would be in that region? So more stirrups would mean more capacity. Make sense? So we take AV times the FY times the number of stirrups that go across an approximate 45 degree cow, uh, crack. The only thing that's new is AV, okay? AV is the area of reinforcement. However, you gotta look at it three dimensionally. Like, let's say that this is your stirrup. Okay, well that might be something like a number three bar. The area of a number three bar is 0.11 square inches, but the area isn't a single bar, it's two bars. Does everybody see that? Because the stirrup goes across that, that entire crack. So for this case, the area would be two times the area of that bar. So like this one would be two times the area of that bar. Two times the area of that bar. What about for this one? one times the area of a bar. What about this one? Four. So see, see what's going on? So the idea is because your crack is going to sort of go across this region, so how many bars is it going to have to cross through? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. We're going to call it after this. We'll go ahead. It, and, and yeah, and if not, then you'd have two of these and two of those. Yeah, yeah. All right. Everybody good? Okay. After this, we get into nitty-gritty details associated with shear, and we can handle those for another time. So that's all I have. Uh, I'll see you all either in 10 minutes or next week. So that's all I got.